Okay. So uh, you'll see. I'll post the um, URL. Can someone let us know when the stream is coming through? <coughs> oh, it's not. You know that uh, it sounds like your target is the new user in Mark Tub. What's that? Sorry? It sounds like your target is the new user in Mark Yeah, it says that, but it is. Okay. It is coming through. Yep, it's working now. Ah, uh, okay. You're good to go. Um, all right, so I'm going to count to three and uh, see if you can work out the lag. All right, one, two, three. Have you heard one, two, three yet? <laughs> Michael, do you want to lead off? You're more familiar with the agenda Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry, I'm not in the office at the moment. Yep, there's the delay. Um, this, uh, this meeting is uh, supposed to be focusing on things that are happening outside of the um, uh, Moodle HQ. Um, so we're going to start off there. Um, and one of the people who's been doing some work outside, although he claims it's not really significant, uh, was Jamie. And Jamie's been working on uh, the mock uh, submit of, of forms, which is very useful for um, uh, uh, unit tests and so on. And uh, I thought well, we may as well get him along to, to have a brief word about that. So lead us off, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, hi. I um <coughs> I've been working with the uh, OU um, on uh, some. We're re redoing the quiz reports, and we we wanted to um, <coughs> to have a a thorough thoroughly uh, a, a thorough unit test kind of regime before we started. Um, Developing the, the the new code for the quiz reports, so we've um, we one of the things we wanted to do was to um, to be able to generate questions um, in the we're using the new data generator um, uh, framework to in the unit test be able to generate. Um, Questions uh, which we could be added to quizzes, um, and and those um, quizzes be supplied with um, with data, with um, student attempt data, so that um, we could we could then build up in the database a kind of uh, some some. Uh, Test data to 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 demonstrate what to check that the the, the stats were um, being being generated, being calculated as, as expected by the the stats code. So uh, along the way of doing this, I um, I it, uh, this was actually. Tim's idea that we it would be nice to have a um, a way to to uh, submit have a test to submit um, data to the question forms the question type um, editing forms and uh, to then get the data back from the the form. And uh, then save a question, and uh, using the 
using the the question type code and um, then check that the question load the question again and check that the question was was as expected after we've loaded it again so we um, I, I'm not sure if this kind of duplicates what what's been done with B hats, but it's um, it's on a, low, a lower level um, to to we're working at a much lower level with the question engine API to uh, just to thoroughly unit test um, the all aspects of the the quiz and the question code. Um, and so what we've, we've done, what Michael asked me to talk about was um, this method that I've added to the um, forms lib to uh, simulate a form submission. And all, all that code does, it's very simple, it just, um, you pass it an array and it, it, um, it the array is uh, just in the format that you'd expect the post data to to be in. Uh, uh, so the oh, we got something popped up here. That looks to be the the tracker issue. Um, and so we we can simulate we can inject post data into the forms and um, and then use get data to uh, to to get the data back out of the form as if the form has been submitted as if the form has been uh, submitted by a, a teacher so we've been using this for the question editing forms to 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 test that um, that they, they work as expected. Um, we we would have liked to have been able to use to to instead of um, passing an, an array um, array in the post the underscore post um, format as you'd expect to receive in the PHP script. We wanted to um, to maybe. Um, use set data to to load up the form with uh, with data as if it was being loaded up from the database the um, uh, uh, the data in the format as it would be loaded from the database and to have set data set the defaults in the form um, but uh, that didn't really work we couldn't do that because um, of some weirdness in forms lib that uh, uh, when you try and set the default on on uh, some of the form elements, the the select form element was the problem. The select form element uh, in the question forms has a grade. Um, we have a a grade select form element in the question forms, and and with the float value that was the float value as a string that was the keys for those select um, select form elements the um, the there was a weird bug which meant that the the data wasn't getting through to the um, to the get data to we won't be able to get the um, the data out of the form so um, we went with um, using post instead um, that we simulate um, uh, the we we inject data into the post array um, instead instead of what would be more useful would be to to be able to not to use data in the in the format that we'd get it out of the database rather than the the format um, that uh, we get it out of the oh, that it comes through via post data because basically you just get post data out of the, the in the same format it went in it comes out of get data in the same format so that that's a kind of a long long-winded explanation 
um, of what I did in not very um, articulate, <laughs> uh, a not very articulate explanation, perhaps. I hope some those who are interested could follow what I said. If you have any questions of about what what I did, then. Well, I, I had a question, and Tim sort of already answered it, and that was to do with validation. So, um, obviously, one of the reasons you'd want to do this is so that you could test the validation of a form. And Tim suggested in the dev chat that you can. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the um, it, we've injected post data into the form, so it's just as if the the post data has been submitted in the form, so you can check to see if. Um, the validation fails as expected or passes as expected. And if the validation hasn't passed, then you can't get anything out of get data. Um, I, I did quickly, very quickly, just write a few words on the, the dev um, wiki about, about uh, this new method. But it, it could do with fleshing out a little bit, maybe. I'll, I'll post that um, yeah forms lib is a crazy beast I wonder if anyone's got any plans to replace it to to maybe do something else it I, think, I think everyone has plans to replace it <laughs> that doesn't mean it's happening though it'd be quite a large job to I guess we could have two forms libraries going on at once in Moodle and gradually move over from one to the other with a, a similar API in each of the um, the libraries, maybe. Uh, we could. There was some discussion at the Hackfest last year about it, but I'm, I can't remember where it got to, actually. Um, uh, but, yeah, that's one approach, I suppose. We have a lot of things that will be half migrated from one system to another and end up with two half systems. <laughs> yeah. oh, right. yeah. um, I don't know if it would be interesting to have a discussion about forms lead, actually. If anyone wants to say anything. I mean, was, was this like too impossible to do, this kind of this addition you've made? Was it? You know, oh no! It was uh, very, very easy. Very, yeah. the, it was oh, just yeah. one method added to the the one one class. It's um, I've I'll, I've got some diffs here that I could. Um, you can share your screen, the screen share button on the side, if you want. Uh, Shall I post some um, links in the, the the dev chat that work? Yeah, I I wonder it, how big a job it would be to um, to replace forms live with something more. Um, it's a, a maze of code. I, I I said so at the time. I f I felt a bit. Bad that um, I, I um, maybe hadn't didn't say something sooner or didn't um, try and uh, uh, get that up up the command chain a little bit. Um, I guess you and Peter thought about you. You and Peter must have looked at the forms of code and decided you wanted to go with it. Um, well, at the time, there wasn't many people saying no to it, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I still haven't seen a really good description of, of what it should be doing better. Actually, there's a a strange kind of um, event appy going on in there that I don't really see the purpose of. It, it would be nice if it was more cleanly. Um, I would have thought you could do a much more simple, um, make a follow a much more simple object-oriented approach to to 
making a, a form slip for PHP. I would think if someone did did produce something that it might be quite popular because um, it doesn't seem like there's many alternatives to to pair quick forms. Is it is it because um, it had all this support for client side uh, validation, which I don't think we ever really we never we never even implemented it, but it, it had all these you know quite advanced features in there in quick forms. I've Maybe that's why I was doing something. There's know. a weird, weird kind of event um, uh, oh. kind uh, event responding functionality in there, which I I didn't really. Uh, maybe it's got something to do with the the client. I don't see how it, how it would help with client side. Yeah, I don't know. It's all sort of, I never really uh, did much with forms with myself. Um, there's some comments there in the, if anyone's uh, watching this afterwards. There's a discussion going on in the uh, dev chat about uh, what we talked <coughs> about at the Hackfest last year. Um, there was a sort of a working group talking about it. We split up into groups, discussion groups. Um, and there was some notes on the Hackfest page, so if anyone wants to look that up, it's probably there. Um, but there's no actual plans to do anything at this point. Like it's not scheduled or anything. It's just floating around as it has been for a while. All right. All right. Have we talked enough about forms? I'm Sorry. good. I'm good. Okay. Um, well, thanks, uh, Jamie, for um, for sharing that. Um, I think you'll probably find a few people using it now that it's available. Um, yeah, uh, the next item uh, on the agenda is uh, is Google Summer of Code. Um, at the moment, uh, the Google Summer of Code is um, about halfway through. In fact, uh, at the moment, we're being asked to do the midterm evaluations, uh, so both the students and the mentors involved, and we have uh, seven projects on the go. So um, we're all... Um, putting in that, that sort of um, evaluation at the moment. Uh, all the projects seem to be proceeding um, bar one. Uh, one of the students seems to have gone AWOL. Um, but um, you should start seeing uh, some, some um, requests for testing coming out of those projects soon. Uh, if you're particularly interested, and um, I hope you'll find some of them uh, interesting because they're, they're quite interesting projects. Anyway, um, you can go to the, the Google Summer of Code page. Uh, it's linked off the agenda. Um, and um, you know, go to the projects for 2013. All of the, the projects have various uh, project pages, uh, well, an individual project page. And on that, there should be links to the various forums uh, that the, the students are posting to and trying to engage the community through those forums. Uh, and that's where they're going to be asking for uh, testers to come forward and, and have a look at their, um, their project code. Uh, some of them are, are ahead of schedule, so they've, they've almost uh, got uh, workable products ready to go. So yeah, you should be seeing some of those requests coming out soon. Is anyone else um, in, who's involved in the Google Summer of Code want to say anything at the moment? Um. Yeah, so Tim said that one of his students has disappeared. Which one was it, Tim? Which of the projects was um, affected? Troy. Right. So it was the pronunciation one, which is a shame because it was a 
looked like a good collaboration with James as well. Why just pausing anyway? I just want to test this lag so we have a better idea of how long it is. I'm going to say now, and I'm going to type now at the same time. When you hear it, type now. My gosh, that's a massive lag. <laughs> that's not even finished yet. Okay, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even if other people have typed it, if it just happens to you, just type it anyway, because you'll see how different lags are going to be on Yeah, that's going to be. I've got it down. Yeah. 45 seconds. That's awesome. awesome. Alright, so there's between 45 seconds and a minute lag for most people. So we're not going to have a lot of uh, discussion, you know, between the or video and the chat, so we're just going to try and manage that. Anyway, sorry, go on, uh, Michael. Yeah. Um, all right, so there was some discussion on the dev chat about um, uh, one project. So Thomas was uh, uh, posted a link to a discussion on, on the uh, global search project. Uh, so if you're interested in, in the new global search that's hopefully going to come from that project, you can uh, follow up on that. Um, some of the other projects, <coughs> I was just um, going through them, are um, uh, there's a self-assessment ac activity using the question bank, um, there's a SCORM player rewrite, um, I mentioned global search. There's a core search uh, project that uh, Marina is uh, is mentoring on, and I'm I'm helping her out with that. Um, uh, there's another one on uh, determining quiz authorship uh, using biometrics, which looks rather interesting. And um, there's a portfolio uh, plugin for Evernote being developed. So if you're interested in any of those projects head over to the Google Summer of Code um, docs page uh, and um, follow the links from there to the project page that you're interested in and see if you can get involved at least in the testing um, and those students will really benefit from your experience I'm sure. All right. All right, well um, that's all I want to say about Google Summer of Code. Did you want to talk about the accessibility stuff, Martin? Right, yeah. Uh, well, just in um, uh, in general, hang on, let me turn off the screen share here. Hello. Uh, yeah, so um, nobody likes doing accessibility. It's fairly um, dull stuff for most people. Um, but we've, um, we have a bunch of uh, accessibility review um, issues issues that were turned up during big accessibility reviews um, sitting in the tracker for some time. We did a push in January at Moodle HQ and we knocked off nearly half of them um, as, a, as a group, um, so that was uh, quite a good push. Um, but then the other half have been sitting there for a while and um, we've been hearing from some of these um, accessibility groups like the National Federation for the Blind um, that they will they're not happy about it because um, in some universities in many universities I think they have an accessibility requirement and um, Moodle doesn't we don't have a certification as such to any particular level um, and they 
are putting some pressure on us to um, conform. Um, otherwise, they might be recommending Moodle for use. Um, and that's not a good thing to kind of have people not be able to use Moodle just because of that. So um, we are putting an extra effort in there um, now, and there's a sprint going on now with a front-end team, um, which uh, I think we described last time. If anyone needs to have the front-end and back-end team explained, uh, let me know. But uh, so the front-end team who are focusing on all the user-facing, usability stuff um, in Moodle at, at HQ are working on a sprint, which is almost entirely accessibility issues. And there's um, a whole bunch of adding uh, aim, um, not tags, what's the word? Um, Very uh, attributes. Yeah. Attributes onto things. Um, a lot of little things. So um, yeah, that's happening now. Um, but if there's uh, the issues linked in the in the um, agenda there, if uh, there's any of those you want to help with, or you you want to. Uh, say anything at all, if you want to help at all, um, uh, or help us focus on it, then um, that would be great. That issue is the one to look at. It has lots of, um, it's actually not an issue, it's uh, an epic, and it has a lot of um, issues tacked onto it. Um, we're not, we won't even have time to even tackle them all. Um, so if you've got some time and you want to help, then um, we'd really welcome your help. So after this is done, uh, we'll hopefully try and shoot for some level of accessibility compliance. Um, yeah, so the front end team is working on about a third of those the issues in the Epic at the moment. Uh, they might get through a bit more, but yeah, if anybody else is, is wanting to to help and uh, help Moodle uh, gain that sort of accreditation, we'd really welcome that sort of support. Yeah, start from the bottom ones if you want to write any code for anything. Um, so. Uh, that's um, and that's uh, that's all I want to say about that, really. Um, other than you know, accessibility is uh, is important. Um, the front end team are working on, uh, I guess, accessibility in every possible meaning of the word. So a lot of mobile interface stuff and um, uh, general interface likability and usability. So well, good. I don't know who the Mr. T of the Moodle A team is. Anybody want to hazard a guess? <laughs> so uh, that's all not going to work for anyone else because of the streaming lag, but anyway. Um, OK, so uh, thanks all. And uh, whoever's next, Michael. Um, well, next on the agenda is um, uh, an item for server clustering. Um, so Pet has been uh, looking at a few aspects of server <laughs> clustering and talking to some of the partners about this. Uh, it was uh, an item of interest, so it made it onto the agenda. Um, Petter promises that it's not going to be a lengthy item to discuss. So we'll cross our fingers and hand over to Petter. Hey, thanks. So I prepared a proposal page some time ago, and implemented a few things. Uh, you can see it here. And the current status is that, I think it was last week, it was, uh, there is a new directory called local cache there, which can be used to store information that is cached or separately on each cluster node. It should help with many issues on the clusters. So together with well, cleaned up theme caching and JavaScript caching, this part should be finished. And now we need to discuss uh, the local clustering in MUC, uh, because if you want to create a local cache on a node, uh, you need to deal with cache invalidation. And we also do not have yet uh, browser sessions for MUC or some other types of backends. And another problem which was mentioned is the file storage, which is at the moment hard-coded into one directory. 
how some people proposed uh, big refactoring there. And of course, we lack documentation and some guides how to set up the clustered sites, how to upgrade them, how to install them, how to set up databases, and so on. So it would be great if more people could be involved in this. And yeah, that's pretty much all. All right, thanks, Peter. So obviously, this is still sort of a preliminary work, only going into master, and any sort of um, uh, support from interested people would be welcome. Um, obviously, that's something that affects uh, clustered sites, so very large implementations across multiple nodes. Uh, there's been a lot of feedback from some of the partners on on some of these ideas. So uh, hopefully, it's going to benefit the the high end of our uh, sort of scalability. Um, has anyone got any comments? Uh, I guess in sort of allowing for lag and that sort of thing. Yeah, so Man posted some information there. How long do we have to wait for comments? Dead, dead air. I don't think there's any secretive things going on in the background here. Is that it? Uh, yeah, it looks like yeah. it. I've made your face really big now, Michael. Oh, awesome. Um, well, uh, I'll um, move on then. Um, the next two items have my name yeah, next to it. Um, uh, the first one uh, being this um, item about patched issues, peer reviewing, uh, and the peer review dashboard. Um, we are very privileged to be able to have such a large community of developers, and uh, we really welcome the contribution that a lot of the uh, developers make to Moodle. We've got some pretty well-established processes now for taking those sorts of changes and incorporating them into uh, Moodle Core. Now, um, the, the, there is a, a problem that's arisen uh, in relation to, you know, having so many people contributing, and, and that is that, you know, to squeeze them through the processes creates a bit of a bottleneck sometimes. Um, so what we have is we have a large number of, of patched issues that aren't being looked at very quickly. Um, the, the teams at Moodle HQ do, as part of their regular sprints, have a proportion of the issues that they look at being uh, patched issues, um, but there's probably more patches coming in than, than those teams can have a look at. Um, peer reviewing is also a bit of an issue in that um, we now have a, a number of people who are recognized as uh, developers, at least in the tracker, and they are contributing uh, solutions and pushing them up for peer review, but then some of them are sitting around uh, for some time and not being looked at. Um, 
we've had a bit of a discussion of late uh, uh, about how we can sort of resolve some of these issues. We don't have a really great solution for these. Um, we're wanting to to try and, and keep up with the the amount of uh, you know patches and, and work needed to, to do to complete peer reviews. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to ask for uh, from people who are contributing uh, fixes and putting them up for peer review is to also consider um, doing some peer reviews themselves. Now that might seem a little scary. Um, I'll just share though um, I'll just share if I can find the right window. Um, oh, so this is the peer review dashboard. So if you're looking for um, some peer review work, uh, it's sort of broken down and you can add this dashboard yourself uh, in Tracker or you can just look for it and find it. Um, there are issues on the left which are basically waiting for someone to come along and volunteer to peer review them. Uh, the issues in the middle have been claimed, if you like, so they're waiting for people to actually go in and do the work of of peer reviewing them and then the column on the right represents um, work that has been done on peer reviews. Thanks for sharing the link there. Um, yeah, so there's there's plenty to be done. So at the moment there's there's 22 issues up for peer review just waiting for someone to come along and, and volunteer to take them. Uh, so yeah, if you're, if you're putting in an issue maybe consider looking for something that you can help out with in, in peer review. Now the next question I guess would be, well how do you do uh, the peer review? Um, I'll take you now to the, um, this is the peer review checklist and what this is is uh, a, a basically a list of things that you should look at if you're doing a peer review. So it's not a, an unstructured exercise. Um, we want to make it as, as objective as we can. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you should consider. Not all of them are relevant to every code change, um, but it's worth going through the list. Uh, one of the things that we recommend is that you just copy and paste this uh, checklist down the bottom into a comment in a tracker issue, uh, and then you can put in uh, a, you know, a Y for yes, N for no, or a dash if it's not applicable. And that's sort of become a bit of a standard for, um, for you know, saying that you've gone through this checklist and, and seen where things uh, are applicable. And then you can comment um, below that or, you know, in, in conjunction with that uh, to point out things that you think need to be worked on. Um, and, and this list has evolved. Uh, if you've got any ideas of improving that list, you're welcome to get in there and add bits. But um, it's getting to be quite a, a nice mature document. Started off reasonably simply, but has is, is, is become quite complete. All right. Um, yeah, as I said, we, we, we're wanting to put more resources into peer reviewing. Um, there are a few ideas that are going around at uh, Moodle HQ. Um, one one thing that has been sort of informal as a rule uh, in in relation to peer review is um, the responsibility of people at various levels for for putting things up for peer review. Um, it says in the documentation that all people should go through the process. Um, we've been sort of shortcutting uh, people who are component leads, um, so people who are responsible for an area of code have been sort of able to skip peer review and, and, and put their, their changes straight to integration. Um, we're trialling a, a, a bit of a change in that we're asking uh, component leads to put their their code up, their code changes up for peer review for at least a week. Uh, if no one touches it uh, after a week it can then go straight to integration but it, the idea is to give people an opportunity to uh, peer review issues um, that they might be interested in looking at uh, rather than sort of some some issues can can go by so quickly if they're not peer reviewed, um, so that that sort of been formalised a bit more. Uh, if someone's working outside of their component, if they're a component lead in one area but they're working in another area, uh, they'll need to to do the formal peer review process like everybody else. 
I, I didn't have anything else to say in, in relation to peer review unless someone wa wants to chime in. Um, mm -hmm. Anyone at HQ maybe? All right. Um, no, I think we're all good here. It's more good. Okay. what other people think. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's just for component maintainers. Yeah, which is only really a small, small number of uh, people. Um, for the next uh, issue on the agenda, and I'm uh, promising I'll, I'll keep this very quick, I just want to share a, a, a bit of a, a slideshow. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, recently, we've been sort of looking at the way that we're organising issues in hierarchical fashion in the in the tracker. Um, for you know, you know, time up to now, we've been using um, issues with subtasks, and we've been referring to those as as meta issues. Um, Jira also supports a, a slightly different way of organising. Uh, issues together, and now that we're sort of taking on more of the um, Scrum-related aspects of, of Jira, uh, the system behind Tracker, um, we're starting to to employ that second sort of uh, way of, of organising things in a hierarchy because um, uh, Jira kind of enforces it at certain points. So I'll try and describe the difference between the two two ways now. Um, so just say you have uh, a bunch of issues. And you've decided that these issues are related, uh, so you want to sort of group them together uh, and 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 sort of have a way of identifying that they're related. Uh, possibly, if they're independent issues, the best way is to create what's called an epic. So an epic is another issue and has the type epic in the same way that you would create an issue that's a bug or an improvement. You can create a, a, an issue with the type epic. Um, when you create an epic, you can use that uh, that epic issue to link together uh, separate issues, uh, and and it forms you know a, 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 an epic uh, of work, if you like, uh, you know, a grouping together of issues. Um, what that allows you to do is is to keep the independence of the issues that are being grouped together, uh, so that you can individually rank them, uh, and they can be implemented uh, independently as well. Uh, in relation to what we're doing at HQ, that means that um, we can give them different values when we're looking at which ones to draw into sprints for, for the Scrum. Uh, and uh, if there is a large number of issues, uh, a good example is the accessibility work that we're doing at the moment. It means that we don't have to do all of the accessibility work in one hit and look like we're just doing half of it. It means that we can draw in an appropriate amount of issues uh, in one sprint and then uh, continue working on this in future sprints rather than saying we're, we're going to try and do it all in one one sprint. Uh, the other way is is the way that you might already be familiar with and that is to create subtasks within an issue. Now uh, we have been applying that pretty generally just to group issues together but um, what uh, the idea of subtasks is meant to be used for is to take a single issue and break it down into some component parts. Um, so from that point of view, um, those subtasks are meant to be uh, ranked with a single value and implemented in one hit. Um, and so that, that notion of subtasks is really only meant to be relevant to the developers who are going to be working on, on the task of, of implementing that, uh, that issue. Um, so in a way, we have been a bit uh, misusing this idea of, of subtasks um, in in relation to what 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 is expected uh, in relation to Jira. Um, how do you make this all happen? So just say you wanted to create an epic. Um, the the first thing you want to do is create a new issue, and when you do, you can select the type which is epic. Um, and you have to put in a name for the epic as well. Uh, that epic name field only appears if you, you set the type to epic. Um, once you've created an epic, you can link 
issues back to it, um, you'll if you edit uh, those those issues that you want to in incorporate into the Epic, uh, one of the the fields in the form there is is Epic Link, and if you just start typing in the name of the uh, of the Epic, uh, it'll help you try and find it. it. Has a bit of a search thing in there. You can only have a, a, an issue can only be part of one Epic. Um, once you've saved that, you'll see on the issue um, that it is part of an Epic and you can click on the link to get to the epic from there and the epic itself will then uh, have a list of of issues inside it um, so it does same same sort of linking back and forth as um, uh, as you might be familiar with if you've been using subtasks um, but it's it's done in a slightly different way subtasks uh, so to say you've got an issue uh, you've decided you want to work on it, but you want to break it down into a few more workable chunks. Um, you can do that by um, going to the More Actions menu. Now, if you're looking at the, the parent task, you can say, I, I want to create a subtask for this. Or if you've found an issue that you think should be a subtask of, of a, a parent issue, you can convert the, the, the issue to a subtask. Uh, in both cases, oh, well, uh, if you're converting, it leads you through a sort of a wizard, uh, and if you're creating a, a subtask, it leads you through the process of creating a new issue. Um, unfortunately, um, it's not as easy to to do batch changes, uh, working back and forth between uh, normal issues and subtasks. They're meant to be pretty much stuck as subtasks when they are subtasks. Um, what you get on the parent issue then is a list of subtasks, and here you can see, you know, it expects you to complete all of those tasks, the subtasks, in order to say that the parent is is completed, which is a bit of a distinction between that and an epic. Uh, in the, uh, the the subtasks themselves, uh, they're sort of apparently linked to the uh, parent issue by uh, looking at the sort of breadcrumb at the top for for that uh, that issue. Um, if you're um, wanting to to get sort of a textual view and come back and uh, wonder whether I, should I create an epic or should I create an issue with subtasks, uh, there is some documentation for this uh, in the bug triage uh, page. Um, there's also some in in the document for creating issues, but maybe not in the same uh, sort of uh, rationalization approach. Um, so you're welcome to, to go in there and have a look at that. If you've got any feedback on, on that, please uh, let me know. All right. Um, that's probably enough talking from me. Um, so what was next on the agenda? Moodle 2.6 project uh, progress. Um, all right. Does anyone want to talk to the mobile device improvements that we've been working on? Uh, the front end, someone from the front end team. Uh, actually, Michael, maybe um, there was something added at the last minute on above. Do you want to? Oh, we're going to tackle that again, or? Sorry, I'll refresh. Let's back up and restore improvements. I see. All right. Well, I, I completely missed that. And my apologies. Um, do we should probably tackle that now before we move on to the, the progress item. So, Mr. Russ, Andrew Nichols, I can see you're it. up. Um, well, uh, I think Tim added this one. Um, I didn't know anything about it until he added it, and I refreshed the page. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, I don't, you, don't know if you remember at Hackfest, um, we talked about doing fileless backups, uh, putting back up in the store uh, on the same site to try and improve some of the performance. That was particularly for people running multiple servers because uh, things like NFS make it really slow. Um, so uh, one of the things we've done recently, I can't remember the issue number, but we've now got a file as backups for the same site. So if you're duplicating a site, uh, or duplicating a course using the web services or using um, 
uh, file input, uh, course imports. Uh, so when you go into a course, you click the import button and do the backup restore that way. Um, then we get file as backups, so we don't go to the data store, grab all the files, stick them into a directory, I copy them all, then restore them, um, only to throw them away. Um, so we've done a lot there to try and improve some performance. That also happens for activity duplication. So that should all be a lot faster. And Russell mm -hmm. Smith at University La Trobe in Melbourne has been doing a lot on profiling and fixing performance issues. I think mostly that's been related to um, the quiz questions, but I don't know if he's going to if he's around to talk about it some more. Uh, he's been doing a lot on just general profiling, and I think he's done some stuff so that you can compare multiple uh, performance benchmarks from XHProf against one another. So you get rather than just comparing one against another, you can compare multiples against uh, multiples. I think it is um, to get averages um, to, so that on multiple run, multiple runs of an XHProf. Uh, Comparison, you, you kind of get better averages. Um, I, I don't know if um, Tim knows any more on exactly what he's been doing on the quiz side and uh, other fixing performance issues. But he was saying earlier he's got a kind of 25% um, speed improvement on backup from the store, um, and we were hope I was hoping to when I get a chance look at finding out why when you've got lots of course modules on a course uh, we use a lot of memory because I mean we were doing some backup from the stores the other week and for a small course with only about 60 or 70 I think it was course modules we were using 7 gig of RAM uh, which wasn't, wasn't so good so that's one of the things that we're hoping to be looking at uh, mm -hmm. soon but uh, that's all I have on uh, backup from the store so if, if Tim has any more to say or Russell has anything I know he's in the chat but it is 1am in Melbourne I think so uh, he might be asleep Actually, that's quite surprising it's taking so much RAM because one of the reasons for the backup rewrite <coughs> was, to, uh, was to do that, was to chunk it up more and, and keep it in smaller chunks. Uh, so, I don't know. Okay, it's interesting that's being found. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know exactly why it's doing it. I think it's something to do, uh, well, Russell was suggesting it might be something to do with the amount of times that we keep repassing the XML file. Uh, because we do it for every single course module, I think it is, uh, which obviously gets quite a, a lot of XML parsing. Um, and I, if we don't throw that throw that away properly, I guess that could be related. But I haven't had a chance to look properly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, just I'm throwing this here because I because I can. But my personal pet hate with backup restore is how long the interface is. Uh, yeah. It would just be lovely to have a, because I bet you 99% of the time people just back up everything or restore yeah. everything. There needs to be a skip to the end button or something that you can just like accept all defaults. Yeah, yeah on the course uh, module duplication at the moment, we've got the links in the course page to duplicate something, and that takes you away, but I'm hoping that the 2.6, if we get some time to do some JavaScript this time, uh, we'll be able to make that uh, an Ajax confirmation as well. And duplicate it on uh, on the page, but yeah, we could do doing the same thing for courses somehow. No, oh, cool. cool. Okay, so it looks really good. There's the issue. Thanks. I'll just put it up on the screen a bit. Cool. Um, so, uh, are you still there, Michael? I am. Okay. Um, so. Uh, All right. Yeah. Thanks, um, Andrew. Good job, mate. Um, yeah. Zero notice. That's right. Um, yeah. So, uh, who from the front end team would like to uh, raise a few of the uh, uh, improvements that have been um, done on, particularly on mobile devices and so forth, in the last front end sprint? Um, I can talk about a couple of them. Um, I haven't got the tracker numbers, so uh, if anybody looks up the tracker numbers and puts them in the chat, on other people can look at that. Um, what we did when we started this round of sprints is we um, went and we gathered up all the devices that we have, um, all the different devices and the different browsers, um, 
Android and different versions of iOS and things like that. Um, and went off and uh, did a whole bunch of testing all over Moodle to find pages that weren't working nicely on mobile, uh, pages that weren't working at, at all on mobile, um, and pages that were OK but could do with a little bit of improvements. Um, and from that, we raised a whole bunch of issues in the tracker. Um, uh, some of them were big issues, and some of them were little issues. Um, and we've been slowly working through that list. So some of the improvements that we've already uh, done uh, for 2.6 uh, um, for example, there's uh, the full screen pop up for the file picker and activity chooser. So um, that's actually been done in uh, core dialog. So um, anything that's using a core dialog, um, if the screen width is less than a certain size, that dialog will show as full screen. So basically, you can imagine on a mobile phone, it doesn't really have much make much sense to cram a form or a page into a dialog um, in the middle of the page. It, it you really just want to be doing one thing at a time. And um, it makes sense when you're using it to just have that take the full screen. And then when you click OK, it takes you back to the screen that you're on. Um, so that one's up for integration uh, review for next week, uh, again. <laughs> Um, the other one, we've been making a, some changes to Tiny MCE. So uh, the first thing is that um, there was a lot of problems with Tiny MCE not being able to be resized and not being able to be sized down to a small size. So if it was on a phone, it would be hanging off the right-hand side of the page. So we've changed that so that the um, icons can now, the icons in the toolbar can now fold nicely, and the actual editor itself can. Uh, be made small enough to fit on a mobile phone. Um, uh, Jason's uh, added a new version of the um, Collapse Toolbars uh, plugin. So um, we had a version that was just a hide show, but the new version basically lets you toggle between one and three rows. And we pre ordered all the buttons in the tiny MCE uh, toolbars so that the ones that you want to use most often are in the first toolbar. Um, and that's the one that you see by default. Um, and then you have a button to see the extra buttons. Um, so that looks a lot better. Um, uh, Jason was looking, was wondering about tiny MC themes as well, because uh, one of the other issues that we're looking at is backporting all of the icons from tiny MCE 4 into the Moodle version of tiny MCE, which is tiny MCE 3. Um, Yes, we've been checking out our right to left issues uh, on mobile as we've been doing uh, all the things we've been working on. Um, one of the other issues uh, that uh, Sam has been spending a lot of time on is uh, looking at the activity icons in the um, course page when you're editing the course page. So uh, having a, a row of very small icons very close together is um, impossible to use on a mobile phone. You have to uh, pinch and zoom right in to be able to click on the icon that you want to, to click on. So a um, uh, solution there is something that's been talked about and worked on in the past. Um, and uh, we've now uh, gone ahead and that's been integrated this week. But the icons, uh, the editing icons, uh, there's a few more changes to go um, on these editing icons, but you now get a drop-down menu next to all of the activities um, with things like edit title and uh, move left, move right. Um, uh, so they've been changed from a row of icons into a menu, uh, uh, which seems to work quite nicely. And um, the buttons have been made, uh, the icons that open the menu are a little bit larger and have a bit more spacing, so you can actually um, uh, click on them on a mobile. Um, uh, I think that's that's, most that's probably of the, the most significant stuff, yeah. Yeah, that's most of the big stuff that we've been working on uh, for 
mobile. We're, um, we're obviously doing the accessibility sprint uh, this time as well now, so um, there'll be a lot of changes for screen readers and keyboard navigation uh, and things like that. Okay. Thanks, Damien. Um, yeah, we'll probably, uh, the, the front end team will probably still do more work on mobile device improvements in the future. Uh, it's going to take a bit of a back seat for a few weeks while they work on accessibility stuff. Um, the back end team has been looking at, pr primarily at, um, uh, leading to a new events and logging system. Um, so events has been the, the first target. Um, and that's going to be used as the basis for the future logging system. Uh, one of the uh, critical uh, changes needed to, to achieve a new event system was an automatic class loading system. Uh, and um, Petter's going to talk about that. You still around, Petter? Yes, I am. Well, if you didn't try automatic class loading yet, please do it. And I'm sure you will love it. So from now on, whatever you work on, you should be using automatic class loading. Can you show how it works? <laughs> well, it's a magic. It just works. The only is problem is you have to name your classes the right way. And you have to put the class files to proper locations. And both of these, it's pretty simple. You just start with a Frankenstyle prefix, and you put it into classes subdirectory in your plugin. That's all. And then you just use the class as before, and you don't have to include anything. <coughs> Any questions? What What are the benefits of using this? Yeah. Well. It takes less memory because you don't have to load everything. You can just load the uh, well. PHP loads only classes that are really necessary. So if we have a lib PHP file with a few megabytes of data, which is used only in few areas, instead this includes only the classes that are necessary. And uh, there are no benefits for actual administrators when running Moodle, it's mostly for developers because it's easier to organize your code. You don't have to think about how to name your classes or where to put them like before. Oh, how to include them. So, any questions? Well, I suppose. Oh, one, one thing. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have also kind of automatic class loading for PHP unit. Uh, previously, you had to type PHP unit or vendor slash bin slash PHP unit and then a path to the test file, test case file, test case file that you want to execute. Now you can just type the class name after the PHP unit and the loader for test cases tries to find the appropriate file included and execute the tests. I'm going to improve it a bit more this week so that it works inside subdirectories for the core subsystem. But at the moment, it is fully working for your tests in plugins. All you have to do is to use the same uh, style for class names, so all test cases have to start with a Frankenstyle prefix, and they have to uh, end with a test case word. And they have to be stored in a similar files like for the auto-logging, but with extension test, test 
PHP. So after that, you can just do PHP unit space and then name of the class, and hit enter, and it gets executed. All right. Well, I would have hoped that at this stage, if anyone had any questions, they could have asked. Um, so I think that's going to take a while to dawn on people. Um, but uh, hopefully it'll it'll get in there eventually. Um, all right, which which leads nicely into our discussion of events and logging. Um, I know Marina's there, uh, Pet is there, um, and there's a few other people. Fred's there, uh, Adrian, and so on from the back end team. Um, <coughs> Marina, maybe you'd like to have a a chance to say hello. And or are you in? No, you're not in the hangout, so. She'll, she'll re recognize that she can't do that in about 40 seconds. Um, uh, Fred, did you want to say something? <coughs> uh, I, don't mind. I don't really know where to start, though. <coughs> um, so what's new about the new events, too? Uh, the way the events were working before was that you you would just set up any name of any event and you could listen to it anywhere, which was pretty easy. Uh, the downside of it is that there were no rules on what data to pass, and uh, there was no consist consistency between the different places where you were actually uh, throwing those events. So as we were working, uh, thinking about implementing a new locking system, uh, we thought to Tied, tied that to, to, to work with the event system. And so um, the event system would, we would trigger events in much more places than before. Uh, but in order to have consistent data, we had to create some sort of format, some sort of rules, so, so that the logger would, <coughs> um, would know what to work with. Because uh, the problem we had now with the logging system was that there, there are data passed from one place to, uh, sorry, I don't really know how to express myself. Um, there were places where loads of data were passed so that the logger could do a lot of things with it, and other places where it was less important, um, where less data were passed, and same with the events. So we had to standardize all that. And um, we so decided to create one class for event which can be a bit scary at the start, but the good thing with that is that you, um, the event itself is self-documenting, and uh, so you, you know exactly what it's going to contain, where it's coming from, what it's doing, and why. Um, and, um, and so when you capture this event, you, you know what to expect, what kind of data you, you can expect in there. Um, the new thing also is that, so the ob the observer of those events will work a bit differently. Um, we, you, you will not be able to listen to all events, which might might not be something that that we would recommend. But the logging system would work like that. The logging system will listen to everything and then decide uh, what to log, where to log it, etc. Um, so yeah, the, the automatic class loading also was also implemented for that. You don't have to include anything to trigger an event. Um, the class will be loaded following its name. And um, yeah, I don't really know what to say, what else to say about it. Per, you might want to complete my brief explanation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you share the screen? Okay. Pet is busy filling in issues. Yeah, frankly. <laughs> we can see what you're doing, Peta. Yeah, so um, I don't know if there is any question about the new event system. I um, don't know if, I, uh, if my explanation was clear or not. All right, so uh, yeah, we're going for a much more structured uh, event system, something that's built for speed, 
uh, something that's going to be able to handle small and large amounts of information, uh, something that will be able to feed into uh, multiple handlers, including potentially multiple logging outputs. Um, yeah, so a lot of potential benefits uh, in a new architecture there. Well, Tim, that, that's for speed. Because um, for now, we would we, we, we load all the events in an array, and so um, we know which one exists and and which ones don't, and we can easily like capture them all or just capture one. If we if you want to have more to dispatch the event to specific observers with more strict uh, with um, how to say with different criteria would be much slower and could could be costly. So we we decided to go with catch all or catch one. And if you catch them all, you can just filter by yourself uh, those you don't want to listen to. I mean, so that's that's work that's still ongoing. Um, the events and logging system work is is sort of dovetailing into each other. We're we're trying to see what we we can get done for Moodle 2.6, at least the underlying architecture. But there's a lot of little changes to be made along the way in relation to the um, uh, the existing events and logging calls, uh, which is going to take us some time. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, improvements that have been asked for in relation to the richness of logs, uh, which will will follow on from that. All right. Um, so definitely uh, something to keep an eye on, and and hopefully that'll help uh, lead to to better analytics. Yes, go. I'm kind of just cutting there because um, we were talking about this again t today. Um, so with the logging, this logging <coughs> two spec. Um, we'll be changing pretty soon um, with uh, some stuff from PETA, which is currently on the discussion page, and we're going to be working on that quite heavily in the next very short time. So um, the whole logging proposal is kind of um, big and complex. So if you want to, if you're only involved in an early stage, now's a good time, I guess, to watch this page and watch it change in the next few days or so. Um, yeah, so just pointing that out. I think the, the goal for 2.6 is hopefully to have logging working more or less like it did in 2.5 in terms of, you know, we're logging some stuff. Um, but um, there won't be too many new features other than you can start, start writing your own plugins to do cool things. And that's all. Excellent. All right. Um, the only other thing on the agenda um, is this: uh, the, the the most anticipated change in Moodle ever. Um, I'm referring to the alternate name fields. Um, a billion uh, people in in Asia uh, celebrated. There was there was parties in the streets when this was implemented. Um, and Adrian, uh, Adrian Grieve was one of the people instrumental behind that. Uh, there are some implications to for developers, and um, Adrian is going to talk about that now. I hope. Uh, okay. <coughs> Not much of a build up there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, basically, I think the main people pushing for this sort of change were people from Asian uh, institutions, um, the uh, Japanese Middle Association um, strongly pushing for this change, um, basically so that in their middle instances they can uh, put phonetic information in there and make it easier to uh, Look between different students and differentiate between uh, between them. Um, so uh, basically, what's happened is we've added four new fields to the user table. Uh, these are name fields. 
Uh, basically, we've given them um, uh, sort of names as to <coughs> how we think they could be used, but they're not uh, uh, not definite. You don't have to use them how they're uh, labelled. Um, at the moment, I think we've got uh, phonetic first name, phonetic last name, uh, middle name, and uh, alternate name. But you can change it to use it exactly however you want. Uh, in this change, we've moved one of the settings, the full name display. Uh, we've moved it from, uh, I think it was in server site policies. Now it's been moved to uh, user profile information or something like that. Uh, basically, that's where all the other information regarding uh, displaying usernames is located. And it seems silly to have uh, just that one setting somewhere else. Uh, <coughs> Another thing is that we've implemented placeholders. This is so that you have more flexibility about how your names are displayed. Um, as opposed to just having uh, first name and last name, you can now put brackets around it, or commas, or colons, or any other sort of punctuation, just to make it easier to read. Um, is it uh, Well, I mean, I could pull up. Uh, my uh, my instance of the middle, which I guess I can show you. As oh, yeah, sure. About it. Always good. We need more demos. It's not like demos of these things. All right. Let's at least have one. There's not much to show, but oh, wow, this is the best. Okay. You're holding it up, <laughs> Right. <laughs> Alright. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's in Japanese at the moment. to the um, sitting now where it's currently located. Uh, as you can see here, we have other user profile information. And down here is the new setting, well, old setting re-implemented. Um, re uh, here, um, these are the placeholders. Uh, I've included here, this is a Japanese style bracket, which is what they use over there instead of um, normal ones. Um, well, <laughs> normal is subjective, I guess. Yeah. Um, so what I've got here is uh, first name, last name, and then the middle name. Now, I'll head to a course. Mm. <laughs> And this participants page should show um, people with middle names being displayed. So not everybody has the middle name there. Um, this is If they don't actually enter their information in, then it will sort of uh, remove the punctuation around, around it. It's not foolproof. Um, if you want to try and break it, I'm sure that you can. Uh, but basically, we went for simplicity. Uh, for how to remove that information rather than um, a very complicated uh, regular expression. Uh, another, another thing that um, I made a slight alteration to is the edit page. Uh, so let's be quick. Uh, as you can see here, the middle name has um, been displayed right next to the first name and the surname. Uh, if you put the placeholders into that setting, uh, they will become available in this section here. Uh, and they're disabled ones, the ones that haven't been implemented, are under this section here. 
Hmm. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much it. Um, from this side of things, it's all fairly uh, fairly simple. Uh, basically, <coughs> what developers have to look out for. Sorry. There's a question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, no, the user has no no control over uh, what's displayed at the moment. Um, basically, we're looking just for a fairly uh, straightforward implementation to start off with, and then sort of any further enhancements will come down the track. But yeah, at the moment, uh, only the administrator can determine um, what names to show. Um, getting to my uh, other point for developers, anybody that's made any plugins and may find a uh, developer warning uh, saying that they need to provide more information uh, to be supplied into full name. Basically, the user class needs the four additional <coughs> um, uh, name fields. Um, it will just pop up a warning, won't actually go off and do any searching itself. This is so that we don't make any un unnecessary database calls. Uh, but uh, I've created a, a dev doc page sort of explaining uh, probably the best way to go about getting uh, user information. Um, I sort of recommend using the user picture class to get everything that you need. So, questions? No problem. There is an equivalent um, function to the user picture one that if you're not intending to output a picture. Uh, yes, I, I've created a new, a new function which basically has all of the name fields in it. Um, it gives you the option to uh, either output it as an array or as a string. If you output it as a string, you can actually specify an alias to go with it so that uh, you can easily go into an SQL statement. Right, Ev, and um, yeah, a link to that docs page. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, uh, I think I lost the. Uh, Come back. You were currently there. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Oh. Ah, actually. Just the it's fake. Oh, good. Because I added a new page here. So this is the option name page. This is basically just the specification um, for information regarding development. This is probably the uh, better page to have a look at. It's only just started it, so um, it's probably missing a little bit of information, but um, it should give you a good idea as to what to do. And that's where I got to today. Okay. Thanks. Michael, anything else? Uh, I think we've covered the agenda. Uh, uh, there's some uh, extra questions that have been added, and I don't know if I'll do a refresh to see if there's any more. Uh, there is another question for you on the dev chat while I'm looking at that, Adrian. If you just specified alternate name on its own uh, and didn't put any other information into the setting, um, if the uh, if it hasn't been filled out, the alternate name, it will revert back to the first name. Just first name? Just first name. Uh, basically, that was for uh, security reasons. Um, basically, uh, <clears throat> we didn't want to, that if you set it to first name and then don't provide the information that it reverts back to first last name. Right. 
Uh, okay. Are those all Nadav's questions? Um, well, what's our standard supporting metadata for courses, resources, and activities? Moodle Hub. Uh, I'm not sure what that's about. Um, Okay, I haven't seen that one, Nadav. Yeah, it's all pretty old. Um, well, yeah, I can't really answer this. I don't. Um, uh, what, it'd be nice to have a list of the use cases for it. What's the is it, is it just so you can add an exchange hub? Uh, you can add metadata to courses, resources, and activities. Yeah, it's probably, um, it's hard. I know there's been several efforts at writing a spec for this in the past, um, but they haven't stalled. Um, yeah, we do. Maybe someone needs to write a new spec. And uh, maybe in this issue, in fact, but I can't really read all this um, now. Um, there's no plans to work on it right now. Um, probably uh, the only place I'm seeing anything like this being done is for LTI activities in, you know, those LTI. Um, Repositories like Explore and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, it seems to be that we we need to have some problem for, I mean, some way of doing it for every single item in Moodle. So that's the using the the full addressing of um, you know course module and, and item and everything. Um, so then it would apply across. It would sort of be a layer lying on top of. Everything rather than adding new fields to everything. That's what I would think, but uh, um, that's quite a big job. Um, it's every now and then someone will have a project like that, and they'll need to, they want it, but it's not something that comes up that often. In the end. Um, there is also global search, the global search project happening for GSOC, which might be worth a look at. For the search part, anyway. Uh, second question: What's the stand on Experience API? Um, well, I can start from the last one. The future of SCORM is not much. Um, like we're not going to do anything more with SCORM. I don't think. I don't think um, that um, anybody wants to. Um, they. LTI version 2, we will get there when it's, I don't think it's released yet, is it? Um, but I'm sure the LTI module will be updated for that. Um, CMI 5, I know nothing about, personally. Never, never hearing about it. Um, and the Tinkane API is, as far as I'm concerned, mostly something that we will produce data for. So the new logging stuff, um, We'll, you'll be able to stream that data out in tin can format um, via a plugin or something, right? If you convert our logs, our logs are like a tin can stream. Um, so people can write plugins to do that quite easily, I would say. Um, we're also looking at the tin can um, spec for the verbs that our logging uses. Um, so they'll be really quite close. Um, but I'm not like massively excited by Tin Can personally. Every time I've looked at it, I'm, I'm not seeing like a lot of use for it, um, except in school-like situations. So, um, if somebody wants to write a Tin Can uh, activity module for Moodle, they are obviously completely free. Um, I think actually um, there were some plans to try and work that into school, but I'm not sure. No, I think, no, we'll keep SCORM. Um, see, but almost nobody moved on to SCORM 2004. They all stayed on SCORM 1.2. Um, 
So I'm pretty glad we didn't spend the six months required to work on that. Um, it just never was useful. But there's a lot of SCORM stuff out there, and SCORM will be maintained for a long time, so SCORM packages running in Moodle. Yeah. I haven't been following it. Maybe someone else can talk about SCORM. Dan, you're here, actually. Want to comment? I'm guessing um, Moodle Rooms might work on LTI version 2. Um, they're, they're currently the maintainers of the LTI module, um, the component lead. So um, I think it's probably in their interest to, to do that. If they don't, we'll pick up the slack at some later point. But um, they haven't said they're not doing it. So. Uh, the last question, uh, well, theme clean is the is it the new standard theme? It's not right now, but we really want it to be, or something like it. Um, but I don't think we've decided to make it the standard theme yet. I mean, unofficially, it's kind of a bit in um, uh, early experimental mode, really. It was put in pretty quickly, and there are quite a lot of bugs being discovered in it. Um, <coughs> so they're all being fixed. The front end team are working a lot on it. Um, but ideally, it would be the standard theme. I don't think the other themes have been deprecated for quite some time. Like, you know, over a year, <laughs> I would say. Um, hopefully, the pull to those bootstrap mobile first themes are going to be so strong that everybody will want to move off their old themes anyway. Um, just to get all the mobile stuff. Got to get them off 1.9 first. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Or leave them on 1.9. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. uh, all right, um, there was a question um, a bit, bit further back. Um, well, first of all, someone, someone asked why are we doing the meetings at this time regularly now, um, uh, and uh, I, I should apologise to to all the Kiwis. Um, it's certainly uh, it's not the greatest time when you're in Australasia, um, and if you're in New Zealand, well, it's rather nasty. Um, we we did try rotating through a number of time slots, uh, but every time we changed, um, we'd get uh, objections and this time slot seemed to be the least objectionable time. Um, the other thing too was by adding uh, reliable recordings through YouTube, um, we sort of thought, well, maybe we could have a regular time slot and that wouldn't wouldn't disaffect everybody. So um, we're going to try this and it seems to be going all right um, so far. Um, there was another question as well further up uh, about the hackathon. Um, the hackathon, we pushed it back, we pushed it back again, and then we decided, is it really um, going to, to have benefits while we're all rather busy trying to do development? And um, we, um, we decided, well, we could just put it back indefinitely or we could just sort of uh, can it for now. So. Um, apologies to those people who are really looking forward to a hackathon. Um, yeah, other things took precedent and precedence, and um, we've decided not to hold it uh, now. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Um, is there anything else, Martin? You can think of any other. News. Uh, uh, no, I think that's it. It's, well, I can stick to too many things. That's the problem. And you know, we can just start talking about all the <coughs> hundreds of issues. Um, but I think these are all the main things that are going on. Um, one, one nice little thing uh, we are. Uh, if you haven't heard, we're we're running a MOOC um, 
to try and help teachers learn Moodle um, starting, it'll be throughout the month of September. Um, so that's been quite exciting uh, for the science team to um, set up a server for that uh, on a cluster. Um, we started out on Amazon and we actually gave up on Amazon support. We've gone to DigitalOcean now for those servers. And uh, that's working out okay. Uh, and that's um, that'll, that'll be almost a vanilla Moodle site with very small, a couple of small hacks and um, mostly just showing how configurable a Moodle site can be and how scalable. So hopefully lots of uh, teachers get into that four-week course. So if you know some teachers around the place who probably need to learn Moodle, you might want to send them along. And that's about it for me. All right. Well, I think we can probably wrap it up. Um, Thanks everybody for um, joining us, and um, I think uh, by the numbers, uh, it's possibly the the largest list of attendees that we've had, uh, and I suspect that there's even more people who who aren't in the dev chat that are just following along on the YouTube stream. Um, so the message is getting out there. So uh, we're really grateful for you guys. Um, joining us and we hope that this meeting has been useful for all the developers and everybody else out there. Um, we'll do it again in two months. It'll be our pre-release um, sort of equivalent meeting uh, and you'll get the, the scoop on what's in and what's out and so on. Um, all right. I'll leave it up to Martin to close up right. the meeting because you've got control. Okay. Thanks all. Uh, it's good night from Perth. Um, thanks for coming along, everybody. Uh, so I think we peaked at about 46 people, so that's uh, not a bad turnout. Um, about 50, sorry about yeah. the lag between the video and the text. That's uh, annoying, uh, uh, annoying, and annoying. So uh, we'll see you all uh, next time, and drop in on the dev chat. Ciao all. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.